From the pool room on Pleasure Island, it's the IGN DigiGuys. So please welcome two of the coachman's donkeys, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. Coachman's donkeys? What? That was written by Chevelle Dixon, and we thank you, even though I did not get the reference. Mark? Nobody got the reference. Huh? Including Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. I didn't get the reference, Mark. I did not either. (laughs) We're we're all (laughs) perplexed. I I just work here. Chevelle, you've stumped us. Um, Email us at gods at digigods.com. Please explain. (laughs) We, We don't understand. Uh, you know, um, I'm, yes, Wade. What? I uh, you, you're about to say something. And I'm... Yeah, no, I I was about to say something. I, I was about to say I um I it's just ultraviolet. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I I posted a thing on the on the Facebook page because I want to know what people think is deficient in streaming, and not just ultraviolet, but all kinds of streaming. So I would urge everybody go on there and comment because I want to know what you feel. What is stopping you from fully embracing the whole streaming paradigm? It, it, there's an ideal that we all have in our heads about the way that it should be. If I want to watch a movie, I should be able to blah. That, there's that ideal. But it, it, that doesn't exist. What, what is wrong with the current paradigm? Because Netflix is not, it's, it's not, Redbox, no. Ultraviolet, no. Well, Ultraviolet is, you know what, it, it doesn't seem uh, intuitive or simple. It seems no. like there's too many steps, yeah. and where does it go, and where can I watch it? And it takes a lot of explaining. Yeah, it's too much explaining. It, it was funny, because I, I remember when, uh, when, when TiVo first came out. Yes. I thought the problem, with, the problem TiVo has to overcome is when they say you can pause live television. Uh huh. And I thought, pause live television. Does that mean I'm like stopping time and space? How does that happen? Yeah. How do I pause live television? Yeah. And then they stopped saying that, and and then people knew what it was. Yeah. You know, and I think that there's that there's this that there's a there's a hurdle that they have to overcome. No, I agree. To get people to understand exactly what it is, how much work it takes to get ultraviolet to do what you want it to do. And whether doing what it should do is going to be helpful to you. Too much of a learning curve. Well, you know what? It's funny because, you know, the, uh, uh, there's something a little similar, uh, kind of similar. The new PlayStation Vita, which is their new handheld gaming system. Mm-hmm. You can play a game on your PlayStation 3 at home, right? And then pick up the game where you left off on your Vita. So you play it on the PlayStation 3 at home. And then instead of paying attention to the road... Or doing your work, you can actually pick up the game where you left off on, on the Vita and play it there. It's a little bit like that, you know. There's I like you. when you're introducing new things, new toys, new yeah. ways of looking at things, yeah. new ways of watching, listening, whatever it is. There's always going to be a hurdle, and part of the job of the marketing departments of these corporations is to right. explain it to people in a way that makes them not only understand yeah. it but want it. Yeah. I hear and with you. ultraviolet, I don't think it's there yet. Uh, I hear Mainly you. because I think too with the thing with the cloud. I don't know that people, and again, this might be generational, I don't know that people trust the cloud. Like, what does it mean? Is it in space? Does it exist? Yeah. Is it on a gigantic server farm in North Carolina? What, I mean, what, what if the cloud goes down? Do I lose everything? Yeah. I mean, I think there's still some hurdles there. Yeah. I think, I think on a, even on a digital level, we're all still pack rats. We're all still hoarders. We want our stuff close by. Hey, look, the, the, the other day, it was a quiet day in, in Markland. Yeah. The other day. Mm-hmm. And I actually went through and... and, and and I looked at all my Blu-rays and all my DVDs, because I'm a nerd. Yep. And I was actually able to find some... Du- du- wait, I was able to find duplicates. There are DVDs <laughs> that I own duplicates of. I know. And by the way... I have, I, I have the same problem. Whenever I found a duplicate, it was a great feeling. You know why? Because hmm. I get to take that duplicate <laughs> and, and, and sell it back to Amoeba Records in Hollywood and get credit that yeah. I will then use to buy Blu-rays I really want. Yeah, but then you run into things like I did, where you go and you pick up the the Blu-ray of Deliverance, and you're like, yeah, I finally have Deliverance, and then the press release comes and says, yeah, there's going to be an anniversary edition Blu-ray book of Deliverance coming up, and you go, crap. Hey, look, I... Tired of that. Look, since I didn't buy my copy of West Side Story on Blu-ray... Yeah. You know, if I had bought my copy of West Side Story on Blu-ray, I could have traded it in for the corrected version. Remember there was that issue with the Mm. opening credits? Yeah. But because I got mine for free... I can't trade that in. 
Mark, we're going to start off on, uh, on you're British ignoring, television. You're ignoring me. I am. We're going to start off today on British television. We haven't done it in a while. We are going to be... Now, next week, we're going to uh, get around to talking about uh, Downton Abbey, the uh, first two seasons on Blu-ray, which we didn't get the first season on Blu-ray previously. Got it now and the second season. Uh, I'm going to just tease this. I, I think I'm hooked. I do. I, I, I didn't want to say it. I thought it was going to be like, you know, I was like, everybody else is just getting way too into this. And uh, I, I, you know what? I'm hooked. Damn it. Um, but for now, I'm going to talk about Midsummer Murders, set 19. You know what, Mark? Set 19 of Midsummer Murders, totally different from sets 1 through 18. That 18? Completely different. It's 19 too many. Entirely different. This thing, uh, it, it's weird. Like, set 19, suddenly it's a comedy and it takes place in, uh, in, in Dubai. It's the strangest thing. I love Dubai. I, I, I want to go to Dubai someday. I, I really do. I, I, I want to go to the, the seven-star hotel in Dubai, even though there is no official designation for a seven-star hotel. It's insane. They still call themselves a seven-star hotel. It's like a triple X movie. And I want to go. Yeah. Well, no, seriously. Midsummer Murders has been around for so incredibly long, and it's because it's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great mystery series. It's a great uh, procedural, British procedural. And it all takes place in the countryside, which is what kind of gives it its appeal. It's why people enjoy it. And also because it follows that great British tradition where the uh, the, the mysteries are all feature length. So these are, you know, and they kind of did that back in the 70s, too, with the, uh, the the mystery movie, you know, Macmillan and Wife and McLeod. Those were, those were feature length things at the those time. Those were horrible. They were. McMillan but, and Wife. But you know what? There's something to be said about a, a show, a series where you get more than just 60 minutes at a time, where it really kind of soaks in and it's like 100 minutes and it really, really, they really put a lot of effort onto it. So there are four of these on set 19, uh, The Made to Measure Murders, Sword of Guillaume, Blood on the Saddle, and The Silent Land. Uh, all of them very, very good and beautiful on Blu-ray. And then we also have, uh, going through this real quickly, uh, Land Girl Series 3. Now, this was a, a, a pretty decent, the, the concept here was a good, decent movie many years ago, and then they turned it into a series. Uh, Mark and I have a friend who wrote the score for the film version. Um, and uh, this is this is lovely, Land Girl Series 3. Um, this is, um, you know, it's it's okay. I mean, the whole, it's you know, it's World War II, and it's... Uh, you know, women in working, doing whatever they got to do in World War II and, uh, you know, doing the women's land army and working the fields and, and all that stuff. It's a little bit of a soap opera, not too different from Downton Abbey in that respect. But it's perfectly fine, and uh, Series 3 is, is lovely. Uh, a lot of great actresses here. Sophie Ward is, is quite fetching. Um, that's from BFS, and uh, BFS also gives us The Indian Doctor, uh, Series 1, which I was entirely and totally unfamiliar with. Uh, Mark, you ever heard of the uh, the Indian Doctor? Mark, no, are you there? No? no, this is from the. This, this is, is this is your part of the show, Wade. Okay, this is fine. all you. Well, this this is from like the mid '90s. I'm not. I, I you know like '96, 90, '97. That's when this thing uh, ran. I'm not at all familiar with it. But uh, this takes place in uh, 1963 when Indian doctors um, first coming to the UK to basically, you know, uh, see if white people would be willing to <laughs> let Indian doctors operate on them and uh, or even, you know, uh, just be like family doctor or whatever. Anyway, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a very specific place and, and point in time as, and very, very culturally specific to something that I guess is unique in the UK, this whole kind of post-colonial uh, adjustment period that has a racial dimension, that has a, a sociocultural dimension, that has a... a um, a class dimension. Uh, so, I mean, in that respect, it's interesting. I just don't know how, um, you know, sort of broad-based it is to, you know, the Downton Abbey crowd. Keep talking about Downton Abbey. Uh, Primeval, Volume 3, on Blu-ray. This has been a big deal on BBC America. Uh, and uh, you know what? It's just, it's the same thing over and over. I, it, it feels very much like more of the... It, these are all the, the unholy children of the Night Stalker, basically. Which they're making a movie out of. Which yeah, I know, but it's like they all we have tons of these shows in here in the U.S. and they they're all over. You know, the the even uh, the X Files is kind of part of that as well. Um, so anyway, um, the, if, if, honestly, this thing has like a, a huge following, and uh, if you love it, I guess you love it. I find it a little bit tedious. Um, I also find this the whole fairy tale obsession tedious. I don't get these new shows that we have here. I like. Uh, um, Once Upon a Time, I don't get it. Have you seen it? No. Grim, I don't get it. Have you seen that? 
Do I, do I have to answer that? Yeah, I guess I not. I have not seen it. Well, anyway, The Adventures of Merlin, the complete third season. I don't know how they keep this thing going. I really don't. Uh, they've got Merlin and they've got Robin Hood, both of which are taking literary material and stretching it way too far for the sake of television soap operas. Um, generally very well done. Also a BBC production, but it just all feels a little too... It's all kind of Doctor who as well. Um, but very nicely done. This comes to us on DVD, not on Blu-ray, and uh, comes with some, uh, some commentaries and some behind-the-scenes stuff. You know, if it's your thing. Uh, much more everyone else's speed is the HBO series Game of Thrones, which is starting its second season very soon, which means, in true HBO fashion, they are, uh, they're juicing everybody up with a big, fancy, splashing, extras-packed Blu-ray release of the first season. And uh, Game of Thrones I was relatively unfamiliar with until um, my sister-in-law and her husband informed me, explained to me everything about the egg and all of this stuff, and it's very Lord of the Ringsy, and they've, uh, the, you know, the, the books apparently are uh, are rather engaging. So um, I gave the show a chance, and I find it okay, a little underwhelming. I was expecting much, much. Uh, much more impressive production value, much more kind of epic television stuff. Mark, you're making a you're making a squishy face. Yeah, you know everyone's talking about the Game of Thrones, Wade. Everyone loves it. H- Look, here's the thing. Next, HBO's got two things going on right now with Game in the title. What are and Game of Thrones and and what Game else? Change? Ga- oh, Game Change. Yes, that's right. But that's not a series. That's just a movie. It's a big time. It's a big time for HBO yeah, right now. I suppose. Anyway, I, look, it's it's fine. It it does have that whole kind of mythical Lord of the Ringsy thing going. It's got British actors. It feels heavy. It feels weighty. I hope the second season sort of pushes into better territory, though. It just still felt like it's missing it just a beat. I wanted more. I'd been led to expect more. Um, but that being said, uh, a lot of amazing extras here. Really, really good stuff uh, made specifically for the Blu-ray. And, uh, you know, all the behind-the-scenes stuff and uh, really very, very nicely produced. So I'll say that much. They really, really know how to go the extra mile with the, uh, with the Blu-ray. Uh, we also have from Acorn, another BBC series, George Gently, Series 1 on Blu-ray. Now, this has been on DVD before, and they're finally pushing it on a blue, onto Blu-ray. And uh, I don't know that it necessarily benefits tremendously well from Blu-ray. It, uh, this, was, this is about five years old or so, and... Um, as a cop show, it's extremely well done. It certainly has high production value. I just don't know that it uh, it needs to be. I mean, if you have, if you don't have it, go ahead and get it in Blu-ray for sure. But uh, as far as you know, upgrading from Blu-ray to or to, to Blu-ray from DVD, I don't know if that makes that much sense. There's, uh, also from Acorn is something that's absolutely outstanding. This is called the Brontes of Haworth or Hayworth, depending how you want to pronounce it. The dramatic lives of the literary legends, and uh, this is lovely. I uh, thoroughly enjoy this. I had I had no idea this had ever been done. There are a few of these that have been done over the years. This was originally from 1973, and um, in the story of the Bronte sisters and their uh, their. Their very stern father and their loser brother is fascinating. Steve Bronte. And uh, it's interesting because Michael Kitchen from Foil's War plays Branwell, the, the, the layabout loser brother. And uh, some great performances uh, kind of dramatizing all of this. Not what it probably should be if it were done today. But uh, actually quite nice. Very literate and very informative. And I uh, was thoroughly, thoroughly engaged. So 70s British television doesn't always work for me. But in this case, it, I really enjoyed it. And then Agatha Christie's Poirot Series 1 from Acorn is out on Blu-ray as well. Completely remastered. And I got to tell you, this stuff always looked like crap to me when I watched it in broadcast. And when it was on DVD, it kind of looked crappy. They're great mysteries. Don't get me wrong. They're really terrific. Um, but then I was thinking, really, is this really going to benefit in Blu-ray? Is this like that horrible, grainy, bad photography, that underlit look that made this stuff look like it was just... You know, made for a buck, buck and a quarter somewhere in in the Highlands of Scotland. Is that really going to sh- shine on Blu-ray? And yet the answer is, yeah, not so much. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> it's uh, it's four three. First of all, it's not full widescreen. The stuff was shot four three. Um, so it, it's a, the color is better. The grain is still a bit of a problem. The resolution and the artifacting is still a bit of a problem. But it is more colorful. So I'll I'll um, you know I'll leave it at that. That's the uh, set one, which a lot of people already have. Only three more, Mark. I won't torture you any longer. Borgia, Faith and Fear, Wade, season um, one. Wait, I'm on Match.com right now looking at girls. Really? I am. Match.com? I swear to God. What happened to J-Date? I, I have that one, too. Okay. I do. I have them both. There you go. That's my boy. 
That's my great. boy. Yeah, you know what? I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> Why? I, really, I really am living a great life. Twelve episodes from uh, Borgia, Faith and Fear, season one from Lionsgate. Everybody's getting in on the uh, the dramatization of the Borgias now. Uh, you know, we were sort of a little bit aware of it back when The Godfather was made, because as everyone should know, The Godfather is uh, sort of based on the Borgias, one of the great medieval horrible families that uh, dominated medieval politics and religion and everything else. And uh, you know what? This is this is decently well done. A little bit soapy, but then again, the Borgias were soapy. Production value could be a little better. I'd love to see it on Blu-ray. I think it would benefit, but we only have it on DVD. You know, speaking, of, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. You know, uh, I just watched the um, the premiere of the Hunger Games. It's a big premiere. Have you not, seen the movie? I have not seen the movie yet. Okay, but I was watching the premiere. You know, the big cast and crew that was on uh, E. They had a big thing about it. Sure. And you realize that, like, if you're that age... What age? You know, you're a girl and you're 15, 17, whatever. Oh, yeah, I totally relate. You want to be in that movie. Because these, you, know, like, you know that these girls want to be in that movie. They would love to be in that movie. And, and I remember watching this premiere thinking, what equivalencies are there in our lives? Like, for instance, if you're Italian... You wanted to be in the Godfather three when you heard that they were. That's pi- true. That's when you true. heard that they were that they were picking up the Godfather after yeah. like you know fifteen years, whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever that hiatus was. Yeah. You know, every single Italian in the world would give anything just to be an extra true. in a street scene yeah. in that movie. That's true. You ha- and, and, and who they wind up with? Andy Garcia and George Hamilton. <laughs> but I was thinking, I was thinking when I was when I was that age, when I was like ten. Wade, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to test you. Okay. When I, on, you, you go back in the Wayback Machine. When I was 10 years old, okay, that's the, the, that, that, that's the, that's the, 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 the clue is 10 years old, not, mm-hmm. not 17, not 22, whatever. What movie did every single, and maybe even 12 years old too, mm-hmm. 10, 10 is probably even a little young. What, tw- what movie did every 12 to 10 to 14 year old want to be in back when we grew up? When well, we see, grew up, I was my answer to your question before you asked it was going to be apple pie, but that doesn't really apply now. <laughs> no. So I have to come up with a different answer. So what movie when we were about twelve years old did we all want to be in? Yeah, maybe even fourteen, something like that. Okay, there was well, a movie that came out. Well, I'm going to guess that you're probably going to answer Star Wars. No, no, Close Encounters. No, Logan's Run. Yeah, you're, no, you ready? It's going to kick your butt. Okay, hit me. Now, should I give you a hint or should I tell you what the movie is? Well, I'll tell you what my answer would be. What's your answer? Okay, my answer would be I wanted to be in an unmarried woman. <laughs> um, but well, who are you? What is that? Is that a joke? I, I, no, I I just love Paul Mazursky, and I just thought that was I like no. Jill Clayburgh, and I thought that would be a you know a nice world to inhabit. When I, I was okay, love to get to know Jill Clayburgh uh, a little better because she up. was okay, no, an unmarried up. woman. Shut up. When I was fourteen years old, yes, the movie that came out around that time, whatever it was, that I just had to be in, yes, and I was jealous of everyone who was in it, yes, and I had dreams of being in it, yes, was Bugsy Malone. You're out of your mind. Are Bugsy you serious? Ma- Bugsy Malone was a film. It was a gangster film with Scott Baio and Jodie Foster, yes. like his gangster kids, directed by Alan Parker. Yes, it was his directing debut. What? What do you think? The I mean, it's, a fi- I- it's fine, but why would you want to be in it? Because. The movie was, for those who don't know what Bugsy Malone is, it's a, it's a terrific film. A, a, actually, kind of a forgotten film. It is. It, it was a, it was, it, it's a gangster film. With kids. But the whole, like, the whole concept yes. is that every role is played by a kid. A kid. Yeah. Including a very young Scott Bayo, very young Jodie Foster, directed by Alan Parker. He was a real yeah. director. Yeah. And I remember seeing that movie, and I was, I would dream of being in Bugsy Malone. Okay. Fine. I guess. <laughs> you really? You did not think to yourself, I want to be in the Bugsy Malone. No, you know You're the, 14 years old, okay? It's not like you want to be in Star Trek, the motion picture. You want to be in Indiana. No, you want to know the Alan Parker film I wanted to be in? The Commitments. Uh, no, um, uh, Midnight Express. <laughs> That's the one I got. I wanted to, I wanted to you know, right. strap hashish to my stomach when I was 12 and, and run around uh, Istanbul and get chased by, get you know, Interpol and get thrown into a prison where Randy Quaid gets his testicles beaten out you can um, you know what you can still live that dream I, I could i really could you know what french fields the complete collection is uh, is just lovely if you've never seen this anton rogers and julia mckenzie who are almost not the least bit known outside of uh, the uk did this absolutely charming uh, sweet series 
which is, I guess, uh, and this was for Thames originally, like in the late, uh, it, it ran for a few years from uh, 89 to about 91. Um, this is, it's a little bit kind of semi sort of Green Acres-ish, although not as corny. Um, you know, it's this, it's this couple and they go to France to sort of reinvent their, uh, their, their lives and their sensibilities. And uh, it really is. It's very charming. I mean, you have to sort of have a sense of what the uh, the cultural divisions are between the French and the English to really, really get into it. But it's absolutely charming and really well acted and very nicely and smartly written. So I do recommend that, the complete collection. That's in, from Acorn. And then also, lastly, from Acorn uh, is Poldark, the complete collection, which is, uh, oddly enough, I would say one of the best of, uh, of these things that we've talked about today. I would love for Acorn to put this out on Blu-ray. I don't know how it will necessarily benefit, because this was also 4.3 full screen. But uh, I have a feeling that the, the sort of pageantry of it would work a little bit better. Um, Basically, uh, Robin Ellis, if you're familiar with The Good Soldier, he stars as Captain Ross Poldark uh, in something that's a little bit sort of, it's a little bit of a swashbuckler, I guess, a little bit uh, Victor Hugo meets uh, Alexander Dumas kind of a, you know, thing deal here. And uh, the character actually is an Englishman who um, returns to, uh, from the American Revolution escaping from a prison camp, a French prison camp. And uh, then you go into these adventures uh, and these, uh, you know, these, these roguish exploits, which are rather pretty cool, really well done. And, um, you know, for the, for when this was done, back, back in the uh, mid to late 70s, it uh, really captured some pretty great production value, which are impressive even by today's standards. So try to, try to do this on Blu-ray at some point, Acorn, please. All right, Mark. Um, Oh, can I start paying attention now? Yes, you can. You can start paying attention now. Um, let's get into some... Uh, here. Ah, gosh. I'll, uh, you can... That's your thing right there. You can get off on that. But I'm going to make a quick mention right off the top of uh, Fritz Long's uh, The Spiders, which is uh, out from Kino, an authorized restored edition. If you've never seen The Spiders, it's, uh, it's not the best Fritz Long ever, but certainly for Fritz Long completists, you're going to definitely want to hang on to it. It's um, sort of uh, Indiana Jones-ish, I guess, in some respects. Uh, this is from 1919 and uh, 1920. There are uh, two episodes here, and uh, the first one is a little over an hour. The second one is 104 minutes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of... It, it, it's very much in the serial, the early serialized thing. Louis Fayad was, of course, the kind of the father of the serial, and uh, Fritz Long decided to try his hand at it, and did something that is very, uh, very cool for its era. Although it's not, it doesn't really play to his his best strengths, but it's uh, it's quite nice, and um, you know, Kino has done a very good job with it. Um, but uh, I think uh, if you're a Fritz Long fan, you're not necessarily going to see him at his best here. Long it up, baby. Uh, melancholia. You know, I have a real love-hate relationship with Lars von Trier. And we all you, do. You have a hate-hate relationship with Lars yeah, von Trier. I used to love him, and then I hated him, and now I'm just sort of indifferent because he's, he's kind of a jerk. Well, he is a jerk. But, uh, you know, with Antichrist, I, I had finally given up on him. But with Melancholia, I feel like I am ready to possibly embrace him again. Uh, I think this film goes a very, very long way to make a very simple point, which I don't think is a compliment. But um, i got to tell you, if, if you... Uh, if you wind up renting this Blu-ray, and I believe you should, then you should make sure that you uh, close your windows and close your doors and tell your neighbors because you have absolutely got to blast the first 10 minutes of this film. Loudly. Loudly. Yes. Yeah. It is very powerful and very well done and a great way to start the film. Uh, the Blu-ray is gorgeous looking, just absolutely gorgeous. It's... Um, it was really well shot, and I have to say that there's no there's there's great detail in, in clothing and everything is just looks gorgeous in this terrific Blu-ray. Uh, audio quality is pretty good too. There's a couple okay uh, uh, special features, nothing great. Uh, there's a feature right about the special effects and the visual style and the uh, and you know there's a show from uh, that was on HDNet 
uh, featurette that was on HGNet, a couple this, trailers. This one best picture from the uh, National Society. I don't know how that happened. I don't know either. And you know what? Uh, Kirsten Dunst won Best Actress at Cannes. Yeah, she which did. Which I found a little strange, too. Just got nothing from the Oscars, nothing from no. anybody else. But the National... That's what I found so weird. The National Society of Film Critics, you know, we tend to be able to kind of do the film critic algebra pretty easily. Uh, but, you know, where you think, well, the National Society has, you know, a certain number of people from the New York Film Critics Circle, and then we got a handful of our colleagues from LAFCA who also belong... But the LAFCA members don't go to New York for the final round of voting. They just vote by email in the first round. So, you know, we know a lot of these personalities and we know their tastes. And then when the New York film critics come out with their awards and then LAFCA comes out with theirs, and we know these people, we kind of do the math in our heads. And we usually get a pretty good, you know, we can usually guess fairly well at what films, based on those favored by those two groups, are going to sort of be in the running for the National Society. This came out of the blue. I didn't see this at all. I just thought, really? Melancholia? Like, this was not anywhere in New York or anywhere with LAFCA. How did this emerge from the pack with the National Society? It made no sense to me. I don't know. I really don't. And I have to say that uh, I think... It's such of, a bizarre choice. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a return to form for Von Trier. At least it makes him feel a little bit sane. But I do feel like it was kind of overpraised. Um, Wade, big, big, big doings, Wade. Big, big doings. What big doings? Big doings. Ralph uh, Bakshi. Yes. Is uh, he's uh, being interviewed now? Yes. There was an interview with him in the uh, paper. Oh, in the, the, other in the day. Times. In, in the, the Times. Times. Yeah, there was. It was a great. I loved reading about him because he's kind of disappeared. Yeah. And I think his greatest achievement was not Fritz the Cat, an X-rated cartoon. Well, it was a scandalous achievement. Fritz the Cat was not a horny cat. Nor was it even the Lord of the Rings. Now he did an animated version of Lord of the Rings in the in with the, a lot of rotoscoping in, in it. Actually, it was yeah. very very avant garde, very kind of it really was. The envelope. Yeah, and this is seventy eight, so it was a long time ago. It was well before the uh, the new films, obviously. To me, his, his uh, crowning achievement was Wizards, and Wizards is just a really interesting. You know what? You know what it reminds me of? It reminds mm. me of the Dark Crystal. Yeah, a little bit. Just in terms of like you get a... The design, certainly. The, the, the design concepts, the, the feel. The design concepts and the feel of it. And here you get a guy, Ralph Bakshi, who's, who's totally unfettered by any outside influence. This is the movie he wants to do. Just like Dark Crystal was the film that Jim Henson had always wanted to do. Yeah. You know, outside of the Muppets and whatnot. And this is just a really interesting film. There's some great character um, designs in it. And, you know, the animation isn't as, you know, it's not as uh, uh, envelope pushing as, let's say, his Lord True. of the Rings. yeah. But I still think it's a terrific film. I agree. It really is good. And it's finally, finally, finally out, not just on a, a Blu-ray, a, a DVD, but on Blu-ray. Fantabuloso. And it comes with a 24-page collectible book, which is nice, a commentary by Ralph Bakshi. And uh, hopefully this guy will start getting a um, a little bit, a of, bit of a little bit of re- a bounce appreciation. Again. It would be nice. Yes, it would. You know what else is coming out soon, Mark? You've seen the commercials. By the way, I just want to say Wizards, when I was a kid, had the coolest TV spot. The 30-second spot for Wizards was captivating. Absolutely riveting. And uh, it, just, it just haunts me to this day. So, I mean, I thoroughly en- enjoyed that. This is nice. It's in a little uh, white booklet form. Uh, you know what else is coming out soon, Mark? Uh, American Pie 4 or 3 or American whatever American Reunion. But what, what, that's the, that's the, is that the third one or the fourth one? It's the fourth one. one. That the would be the one? fourth one. Yes, yeah, the fourth one. American one. Reunion. You see, we had American Pie, and then we had American Pie 2, and then we had American Wedding. And now we're going to have American Reunion. They can't leave it alone. These people are now way, way too old to be doing these movies, but they still have a following for some crazy, wacky, nutty reason. And so the uh, good folks over at Universal have seen fit to inflict the entire series on us all over again. Because, of course, with American Reunion coming out, you've got to catch up. Otherwise, you might watch that movie and be lost. You won't know what's going on. You know, you, you just, you, the relationships will make no sense whatsoever. So anyway, the, uh, all three of these, American Pie, American Pie 2, and American Wedding, are now on uh, a big whopping Blu-ray, DVD, digital copy combo sets, all of them with nice little cardboard sleeves. And they, each one includes an unrated and a theatrical version of the movie. I'm just going to go out there again to say it, it, these are all versions that have been out there before. You've seen them all, and there is not enough difference between any of these versions to really make a difference. This is a pure marketing ploy. So if you love the movies, that's fine. Truly, the, the, like for example, you know how what the running time difference is between the unrated and theatrical versions of American Pie? They added three minutes. Uh, the theatrical version is 96 minutes. The unrated version... 93 minutes. 96 minutes. What? 
That's correct. Well, maybe they pulled stuff out and put other stuff back in. Yeah, well, not significantly. There's about a six-minute difference between the two America, the American Pie two uh, versions, and uh, there's a it's about a seven-minute difference, I guess, between the two versions on American Wedding. Really, not enough to matter. It it just the story's the same. Um, I will say this: American Wedding is absolutely beautifully photographed by uh, our, our good friend Lloyd. You know that. Oh, is that right? Lloyd shot American Wedding. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It was directed by Jesse Dillon. Uh, Lloyd does all the Jesse Dillon stuff whenever Jesse Dillon chooses to make movies. But anyway, all the extras here, you've seen it all before. So, so there's really nothing, uh, nothing new except for the fact that they've thrown some pocket blue and BD Live stuff on there and uh, some Blu-ray exclusives that are much more about promoting American reunion than anything else. And, um, you know, otherwise, do these films look fine in Blu-ray? They look fine. They look fine. I mean, they're not, uh, you know, they're not going to blow your mind, but they're, it's very competent. Universal has sort of brought their A game to putting these out on Blu-ray. So I'll give them some props there. And uh, then also we have a trio of these TCM uh, Greatest Classic Legends collections that come out from uh, Turner and uh, Warner Brothers every so often. And it's always a quartet of films. Sometimes these are, you know, uh, Greatest Classic films based on a genre. Sometimes it's uh, centered around a director. In this case, we've got uh, the wonderful winner of this year's LAFCA uh, Career Achievement Award, Mark, Doris Day. These are four Doris Day films, uh, and I, I think that they're pretty good ones. Calamity Jane is really fun. Please Don't Eat the Daisies is with David Niven is just absolutely outstanding. Romance on the High Seas, bit of a ringer, not so much. Uh, and Love Me or Leave Me, it's got James Cagney. Uh, Could have been better, but they're all, uh, they're all pretty good. So uh, that's a nice little quartet. Then we also have a um, Greatest Classic Legends, Catherine Hepburn. A completely different kind of an actress. Uh, all four of these are great, absolutely great. The Philadelphia Story, Stage Door, Little Women, and Morning Glory. If you've Morning Glory is the one a lot of people may not have seen. You got to make sure you see it because Morning Glory really is one of her uh, her really really good and very underrated films. Same year as Little Women, by the way, and uh, really just absolutely fantastic. She won her first Best Actress award for it, and, and uh, most people still haven't seen it. It's really a terrific film. But, of course, The Philadelphia Story, it just doesn't get much better than that. One of the great American films of all time. All four of those in one set is a bargain. And then, uh, finally, we get uh, their greatest gangster films, a quartet uh, centered around Edward G. Robinson. Mark, do the impression. Yeah, she, she. See, everyone's got a Robinson. Uh, these are there's really only one of these films that most people will have heard of, which is Kid Galahad, and uh, that's with Betty Davis, and that's an absolutely terrific film. The other three, The Little Giant, Bullets or Ballots, and Larceny Incorporated, are uh, are also very very good. A lot of fun. Edward G. Robinson, one of the great American actors of all time. He knew his place, he knew his persona, and he worked it like nobody's business. And uh, The Little Giant is particularly interesting because it's um, it's got some edgy material in it. You know, it's a pre code film and it really kind of pushes pushes some boundaries all right wait we have two animated films i don't like either of them so i will do them hmm, alphabetically happy feet 2 is out on blu-ray and uh it looks great because it's animated it's like straight from the computer to the blu-ray so it looks great however um this movie is uh, one big unnecessary. Useless, never, yeah, never should have happened. That's the thing. It really, you know what? It's just, it's not that. Fu- you know, the original was cute. I guess fine, whatever. Uh, this one, not funny. Seems totally mercenary mm-hmm. in that it's not. It's not. It's just not necessary. And of course, everything has to be bigger and mm-hmm. louder because yeah. it's a sequel. And if it's not bigger and louder, it, it can't be better. I of know. course, that's not true. Miserable. So. Um, I'm just not a fan. You know, it's got a great voice cast, Brad, uh, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, uh, Hank Azaria, Robin Williams, Elijah Wood, but I just, I'm just i just not feeling it, although it does look great. Uh, this, of course, is another ultraviolet uh, piece of stupidity. So what they want you to do is they want you to load this into the ultraviolet, and then you're on a car trip, and you can either play it in the car on the DVD, which is also included, or the kid has an iPhone, or the kid has an iPad, or whatever the kid has. A uh, kid has a PlayStation or whatever, PlayStation uh, Vita we were talking about earlier, and you can watch it on that. Clearly yeah. what they're hoping for. Uh-huh. Anyway, uh, Happy Feet 2 Pass. Also, uh, I found very disappointing Tintin. The, uh, this is a Blu-ray 3D. We all knew this was going to be a mess. It's a Blu-ray 3D. It's a Blu-ray. It's a DVD, and it's a digital copy. This was directed by Steven Spielberg and written by an ed- interesting uh, uh, team. 
This was co-written by the team of Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish, and they are these British guys who really... Well, Edgar Wright, of course, of, of Shaun of the Shaun Dead. Shaun of the Dead, and, and Joe yeah. Cornish, who directed um, Attack the Block. Right. Now, these guys have interesting... Sensibilities. Bo- sensibilities. Yeah. None of which are here. <laughs> what I didn't like about Tintin, mostly, just to, just to top line it, is that I thought it was just relentlessly noisy. It was just a big, cacophonous noise of nothing you didn't care about Tintin yeah. you, you didn't care about the kid you didn't care about the dog you didn't care about any of the characters it was just big and loud and then it ended and you know there's there's a shot that Spielberg is so proud of it's like it's a chase scene and in the chase scene it's like basically a 12 minute uninterrupted yeah. quote unquote shot who cares who cares it's motion capture motion capture not important what's yeah. important is you care about the characters you care about the story you care about the people none of that happened this is and, and you know what it's it's you can tell that Spielberg is a little energized by the possibilities of what he can do in this yeah. new medium but the thing is that that doesn't mean that he should just throw it all into one film because yeah. ultimately you, a film needs pacing they need the quiet bits they need the noisy bits they need the fast moving bits. They need the slow moving bits. This doesn't have that. This is like all fast moving stuff. And again, you don't care about Tin Tin. Uh, so I just found this a great disappointment. That's unfortunate. Now it looks great because I love the, I love the comic books. I mean, I they're they're, yeah, they're amazing. Er, it's er, tan tan. Yeah. You love tan tan. That's how you but say it in French, right? Yes. Tan tan. Yes, that's that's right. And they've done animated films in France in very rudimentary tan tan. But they're good. I got three cult films here that I'm going to uh, dive into. Um, real quickly, Fat City, New Orleans. Uh, this is, you know... I'm if, going to New Orleans next month. Well, you'll love this then. I am. Really? Yes, I'm going to Jazz Fest. You're, you're going to Jazz Fest? I am. In New Orleans? Yep. I've never wow. been to New Orleans. By okay. the way, if, if anybody has any recommendations for places to go in New Orleans, and you can't say go to hell because that's not fair. Okay. Uh, well, email good. us at gods at digigods.com. Never been to New Orleans. Okay. Well, very good. Fine. Fine, be that way. Uh, you know, now this is not a, a an old film. It takes place in 1979, but it it does it it is kind of a, a wannabe cult film, and uh, it's sort of like um, oh, uh, Dazed and Confused meets um, American Graffiti in New Orleans, and uh, that's really all it is. It's just a 1979 coming of age movie about kids, and it tries to be cool and slick and culty and it kind of is you know i it should be kind of a midnight movie somewhere but anyway that's uh that's an interesting little curiosity on blu-ray this week um not quite sure why they think they can make a go of it on blu-ray but bravo you know it's always good to have a dream uh then there's a movie mark called zat have you ever heard of Zat? Z A A T. I've heard of Zapped, the Scott Bale film. Well, this is an absolutely honest to goodness 1970s era uh, cult movie, and I know 1970s era cult movies, and uh, I had never heard of this. Um, this one came completely out of the blue, and uh, I just I don't even know what to make of this. This is from Cultra, and here's the plot of this. I'm going to read it right off of the packaging, okay? Because there's no way that I could do justice to this more than what this says here. Strange occurrences begin to plague Cypress Grove after a disgruntled ex-Nazi scientist disappears into his makeshift lab on the outskirts of town, only to reappear as a half-human, half-catfish monster. As part of his sinister plan to rule the world, he also takes to polluting the local waterways, mutating the local aquatic wildlife. Yep. That's, cool. that's, that's the plot. It's a, it's a documentary. Yes. <laughs> Half catfish. Uh, you know what? It's weird and wacky and uh, and hysterically bizarre. And I there it is. There you have it. Uh, and then the last one is a giallo film. And, you know, the giallo genre, really, it's all Italian uh, slasher and gore movies from the, uh, the 70s and, and all, even on into the 80s. This is from the mid-70s. And th- what I love about this genre is that they had titles that were metaphorical. They sort of conjured your imagination. They didn't they didn't just come out and tell you what the movie was about. They forced you to just kind of think like what's that well what's that really mean? You know, like how in Chinatown it doesn't really take place in Chinatown and Brazil has nothing to do with Brazil and it forces you to kind of think like well, why why does it why does it have that title? Same thing for this movie. Uh, the title of this film, this is on this is on Blu-ray. This film is is titled Strip Nude for Your Killer. Now, Mark... Um, so that's another documentary. It is, in fact, a documentary, yes. 
Um, so, you know, it, 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 is anyone nude in this? Well, yes. Does anyone, is it, are there killers in this? Well, yes. But it's about so much more than that. Um, I don't really know what it's about, but it's, I'm, I'm sure it's about more than that. Um, it's directed, directed by Andrea Bianchi, a giallo director I have never heard of. And uh, it's, it's pretty terrible, but kind of funny at the same time. So there you have it. You know, Wade, hmm. there was a movie. Ah, uh, yes. There was once, <laughs> many, many moons many, ago. Many, many years ago. I feel like we're a thousand years in the future. <laughs> really? What was it? What was it? This is before movies were beamed right into your DNA, your subconscious. When people were born with Blu-ray libraries in their heads. Exactly. Uh, Young Adult is uh, the latest film from uh, Jason Reitman. Whose short film I actually judged once. <laughs> and, and you judged it wanting. Yeah. Um, you know, it was written by Diablo Cody, so it is a uh, it is a, a reunion, reunion of sorts, yeah, from Juno. And I have to say that I think I said this to Wade at the time, which is uh, I felt uh, Young Adult was a step up for Diablo Cody and a step back for Jason Reitman. Uh, I think this film was totally overpraised. I think it's completely fine. Uh, I, people were uh, heaping laurels upon it because Charlize Theron plays an unlikable woman. In a role that is usually played by like an unlikable, like an unlikable male, and I'm sorry, I just don't really feel the transgression in that. I just don't, you know. Great, Charlize Theron plays a, a woman, Arrested Development, goes back uh, yeah. her, to her hometown to try to woo back her I, high I school like, sweetheart. I like Pat Oswalt in the movie. I thought he was good, but but I didn't think the movie was the, the movie just kind of laid there. It just didn't. You know I, what I mean? I, I, I did. You know, I I didn't feel the uh, the cultural resonance that I felt from like up in the air. I wasn't really attached to the characters like I was in Juno. In Juno, I I just didn't get. It. You I didn't just feel wasn't the there. you didn't feel a satirical edge like you did in Thank You for Smoking. No, it just wasn't there for yeah, me. Yeah, I it I see. I don't think much of Diablo Cody as a as a, as a writer. I think she's uh, highly overrated because we forget what was that what was that horrible thing that she did in between this and oh, Jennifer's body. Yeah. Oh gosh, that was bad. A mistake. It was bad. The most untalented writer to win an Oscar. But you know, uh, everyone expected Charlize Theron to get an Oscar nomination for that, and she didn't. But you know who did, and who would have won in any other year, if not for this whole thing with, you know, the help and the Iron Lady and the, the, I mean, any other year, I'll tell you, Michelle Williams would have won Best Actress for My Week with Marilyn. It would have been a lock. Uh, She is so wonderful in this film. And I think the whole film is wonderful. Uh, Simon Curtis directed it. You haven't heard a lot about Simon Curtis, but look out for him. This guy's going to win an Academy Award within the next six, seven, eight years. Mark my words. He is, uh, he's a real director to watch. He's got a wonderful hand with actors. He's technically very proficient, comes out of that whole BBC Academy that uh, just churns out brilliant, brilliant directors left and right. And he does an unbelievably great commentary on here. It's really, really sharp. You've got to listen to the commentary. I don't say that about every commentary anymore. They all kind of bleed into each other. This one is absolutely terrific. Um, the, and the movie is wonderful. If you don't know the story, forget about how close it is to the, re- to the truth. I mean, it's, it, it's a fantastic fantasy, whether or not it's accurate, forget about it. But it is basically based on the the story of Colin Clark, who went on to become a very successful documentarian, who was uh, at the time a 23-year-old, you know, assistant on the making of The Prince and the Showgirl, which was a a film that Laurence Olivier was directing. He was getting older, and he had hired Marilyn Monroe to be in it to act opposite him so that he could sort of recapture his his youth, his vigor, somehow kind of piggyback on her fame. And she was already, you know, getting into her her later career stage. She was uh, 30 at the time. And all of this this drama took place behind the scenes uh, of the making of this film. And I got to tell you, Kenneth Branagh, who was also nominated for an Oscar playing uh, Laurence Olivier, is phenomenal. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Unbelievably great performance. Michelle Williams is great. Eddie Redmayne, who I've liked in a lot of things, playing Colin Clark, also great. Beautifully shot. Music is terrific. I, there's just nothing bad about this movie. The only thing bad you can say is it's maybe not as deep and heavyweight as, as uh, you know some people might like. But it is a delightful film. And fundamentally, pretty much the same story as... Uh, I, I've talked about this before. Pretty much the same story as The Artist and Hugo and uh, The Muppets, which is it's all about fleeting fame and being fearful of, of losing your celebrity and how do I get it 
back once it's gone. It's all of those themes about uh, celebrity and obsolescence that all the movies have been about lately, and it is just wonderful. Get it on Blu-ray. Michelle Williams, just it, she will pop out of your television set and, uh, and dazzle you. It is a, a delightful film. might even be my pick of the week. By the way, when, when you say that Michelle Williams will pop out of the TV and dazzle you, that is not a guarantee. Uh, no, it's a guarantee. It happened. Really? In fact, that's it, why... It I, will happen. It will happen. That's why i got to get home, because she's been hanging out for the last five hours. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you know what else, Mark? We talked about Edward G. Robinson, and we talked about Fritz Long. And uh, you know what? They actually did work together. They worked together on Scarlet Street, which was a universal film, and uh, it is now on Blu-ray from Kino, and uh, what a great transfer it is. This is uh, obviously not the, again, you know, this is not Edward G. Robinson at his best. This is not Fritz Long at his best. This is uh, 1945, right at the end of World War II, and... um, it is, uh, this film has been out previously on DVD. It is now out for the first time on Blu-ray, and boy, is it really, really good. Um, the, the transfer is just spectacular. Now, the film itself, I, I, I still kind of struggle with. It feels just ever so slightly dated in a certain way. If this had been a pre-code film, I might have kind of uh, you know bought the whole... Like, Joan Bennett is so sultry in this, I almost want her to just kind of break out, but she never really does. So um, I feel like it, it pulls its punches just a little bit. But um, still, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting film and very, very important. And, uh, you know, one of the kind of early mid-era film noirs that really kind of made a dent at the time. Um, the, uh, the audio commentary on here by David Collat, who wrote a book on, uh, on Long in The Strange Case of Dr. Mabuza is quite good. David Collat is somebody that uh, I've had dealings with for many, many years. He's been involved in uh, DVD from the very early days. He's a great film scholar and does a lovely commentary here. So that alone makes this probably worth at least a rental, if you can get a hold of it. Wait, why do you give me all the crappy movies this week? Because you, you're mean. you, because <laughs> you, you can be so much more articulate about that junk than I can. Oh. You, you, you'll say funny things. You'll like, you'll like, oh, three musketeers, more like, and then you'll have something very, very clever to to, to say. I'd rather eat the. Candy like all I would bar. say, you know, all I would say is, yeah, they made this movie like a hundred times. It's never been done right, and this is probably the worst one ever made. There that's you go. All, I'm done. <laughs> what do you want me to say? It's... Come on, it was directed by Paul W. S. Anderson, one of the biggest hacks in the world. Uh, it's the worst. It's a, it's a terrible film. It's a terrible film. But the good thing is that it's on Blu-ray 3D, and that's something oh, well, we can that all get behind. It. Yes, of course it. Yes. You realize how much money this made for Summit? This movie grossed domestically. Yes. A grand total yeah. of $20 million. Did it really? Yep. That's more than I thought. This was an epic fail. Wow. An epic fail. It is just so incredibly, it is worst case scenario of this sort of material. And uh, it's terrible. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about it because I don't like okay. it. All right, fine. Be that way. Uh, sci-fi original movie, Wade. A little thing we like to call Neverland. Oh, anything now, to do with Peter Pan? Huh? Anything to do with Peter Pan, perhaps? No, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm not talking about Finding Neverland. Oh. Which, how much do we love Finding Neverland? I love that movie. So do I. By the way, the producer of Finding Neverland, new film out uh, coming out uh, in May, Hysteria. Have you, have, you, have you gotten any of the screening invites for Hysteria? No. You've got to see it. Really? You will all, it is unbelievably fun. It is fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. Wait, what's it called? Hysteria. It's great. I will tell you nothing about it. Just just look for the invite. I'll, I'll forward some of the invites to you. You've got to get into a screening. It's yeah. great. Great, great, great. I had so much fun, I couldn't believe it. All right. Well, anyway, Neverland is the uh, prequel to uh, Peter Pan. There's a prequel? Yes. Wow. Who it's knew? Unbelievable. Mm. Uh, the cast includes uh, Reese Ifans, who you, you'll, you'll be seeing in the new Spider-Man movie. Yeah. Anna Friel, who's uh, kind of... I uh, love Anna Friel. Speaking of the land girls. Yeah, she was in that. She was in the Land Girls. That is yeah. true. Oh. Keira Knightley also turns up in this thing too, and uh, it's it's not bad. Look, it's a sci. It's it's well to say it's a sci-fi original movie. That just means that somebody else made it and sci-fi bought it. Oh, uh, yeah. Sci-fi did not commission this film. No, they did not. No. Uh, but you know what? It's got some swashbuckling stuff going on in there, and uh, people who love Peter Pan might get a kick out of it. And uh, you know, Keira Knightley is the voice of Tinker Bell, and it's kind of cute. Go. Lovely. Yeah. Why not? Why not? There's a commentary by the writer and director. 
there's an interesting making of green screen to scene, which tells you all about how green screen works. And uh, you know, you know what? I'll take this over uh, the Three Musketeers any day. You know, we have a Criterion this week, and it's a movie that I am not terribly fond of, but I do understand the importance of it. I understand the significance of it. Out for the first time ever on Blu-ray is Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. Here's the problem with The Last Temptation of Christ. First of all, the, never mind the source material, which got you know a certain segment of the population all hot and bothered that there was the, there was blasphemy and, and whatnot. Forget about for, forget about all the religious implications. Scorsese went and made this movie with perhaps a, a fourth of the budget that he should have had. And uh, it, it just, that's, that is, is a problem. It's a real problem. Uh, it feels cheap. Um, it feels undercooked. It feels underrealized. And for Scorsese, even when he's kind of going, you know, full stylish on it, it just doesn't quite come together. Also, the cast, not good. Willem Dafoe, Harvey Keitel. Harry Dean, Keitel. Harry Dean Stanton, David Bowie as Pontius Pilate. These, what? Are, ver- these are very modern. The, it's the, just these weird. Act- Look, all of these actors, even Willem Dafoe, yeah. they all, uh, when you look at them, they conjure up a modern era. Yes. You know, True. you just exactly. can't look, you can't look at Harvey Keitel no. No. and picture him. You, you can't look at David Bowie. It's I mean, just... look, I, I'm willing to go as far back as. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Yes. World War Two. I agree with you, but, with, but no further. But, no. no. Uh, David Bowie, is, he's, no. he's not going to play a Civil War general. He's just... He's not going to play Pontius Pilate. No. Anyway, I mean, it's it's worth watching, and it's it's nicely shot by Michael Ballhaus, whose son Florian is now a, a big DP as well. But it is... Uh, and Michael Ballhaus, of course, also did Raging Bull for Scorsese. He was Scorsese's guy at the time. But it just... It's really... I, I find the film a horrible disappointment. Now, that being said, on Blu-ray, it is a... It is a, a par excellence uh, criterion transfer just absolutely superb all this stuff exists on the dvd as well uh the audio commentary with uh, the, you know everybody involved paul schrader and defoe and scorsese and jay cox of course who uh, who was a co-writer on it um and you know you got a lot of uh, little doodads here location footage that would sure scorsese shot behind the scenes and uh interview with peter gabriel all the usual stuff it's a it's a great blu-ray though i mean it really looks good uh, i just can't recommend the film itself i think it has huge problems and I remember I went and saw this uh, opening day after all the – in Century City, all the protests that were going on and marches around the line. You know, uh, Paul Crouch from Trinity Broadcasting led this big Christian protest in the movie. And uh, I went and I was like, you know, I'm going to make up my own damn mind. So I went and I saw it in Century City opening day. And uh, they were doing all these radio interviews out on the street afterwards. And there were a bunch of, you know, priests and pastors and nuns who were in there at the same time. It was a weird kind of curiosity factor in the in the, uh, in the 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 which I guess was the plit still at that time. Um, but it, the, remember the plit? It was the plit, and then it, and then it became the Odeon yeah. Cineplex. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was, I was interviewed for the radio that day, and uh, I had a very good little quote. I wasn't yet Johnny Film Critic. I was still in film school at the time. But uh, my quote was, you know, I think this movie commits the worst sin of all, which is to be boring. That was clever, right? Wasn't that good? So beautiful. I was getting, I was getting, my, getting my game on. So beautiful. I don't know if that ever actually wound up on regular radio, but they certainly recorded me saying it. Um, you know, Fireflies in the Garden is out on DVD, and if you haven't paid attention to this movie, you really should. You should at least rent it. Dennis Lee is a super, super talented guy. He wrote this and directed it, and it is a it is a very, very tenderly told story um, about a very, very conflicted family. Ryan Reynolds, in one of his best performances, plays a, uh, a very successful novelist who returns home, and um, he, there's a long-standing clash with his, with his father, Willem Dafoe. Julia Roberts plays his mother, and uh, I won't tell you anything further about it, but it is the story of, of what happened to this family then and where it is now. And it is uh, it's a well-told film. I think it was unfairly maligned. Uh, it sat on the shelf for, I think, somewhere between a year and two years. It was. It just kind of sat around because a lot of people will see this, and I know people saw it, and they're like, "Boy, Hayden Panettiere looks looks young in that movie." Well, it's because she was young. You know, everybody who was accustomed to seeing her on, on Heroes on television. This was done a couple of years before that, so um, yeah, she looks young, and uh, and she is young. But the movie itself, the way that it works, is absolutely fascinating and I think it's incredibly well written incredibly well directed and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to anything that Dennis Lee does next I think he's a really really fa- talented uh, 
a really talented filmmaker. And I, it's unfortunate that this thing kind of got caught in one of those indie limbo moments because it, it deserved better and it kind of didn't do anything at the box office. If, all, if only it cost $150 million. Two hundred fifty million. Then the studios John would have, Carter. Then the studios would have gotten behind it. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what the studios should have gotten behind, Mark? What? Tooth Fairy Two. I, 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 was there a Tooth Fairy One? <laughs> oh, there was, wasn't there? It's Laird, it's Laird the Cable Guy. You know the whole Tooth Fairy concept. I swear, I can't believe it. it it's come to this. Tooth Fairy, the, the first uh, Tooth Fairy, was supposed to be an Arnold Schwarzenegger vehicle for years and years and years and years, and that thing just loitered and loitered, and nobody could ever quite make it work. I don't know why. And then finally, it emerged uh, about a year and a half ago. Was it with, uh, with the Rock? With the Rock playing the lead part, and it just went nowhere. But obviously, there were enough uh, crazy white trash people who said, "Oh, I think that's funny. A big, a big muscular guy in a tutu." Uh, so they said, hey, let's do a sequel. Mm, Dwayne costs too much for straight-to-video, and he won't do straight-to-video. Let's see. Let's do Tooth Fairy 2 with Larry the Cable Guy. Get her done. thing is, Larry the Cable Guy isn't even really Larry the Cable Guy. For those who don't know that, that's not how he really talks. He's not really Southern, folks. He's actually a Rhodes Scholar. You know, he's just a guy, you know. he's just yeah, he's that's a, his persona. He's a stand-up comic. He did a lot of stuff in, in like, the 90s, and it didn't really catch fire. And then he created this this hick persona and started talking like he from Alabama. I hired the cable guy, get her done. And next thing you know, everybody in the South thinks, he, "Oh, I know that guy. He's my cousin Hubert's the fourth cousin, twice removed." No, he's not. He's not Southern. You don't know him. He doesn't come from anywhere in the South. It's yeah, a, but you have it's to understand. Act. You have to understand. Yeah. In the South, they're stupid. Uh, yeah, well. So they don't really know that. Anyway, this is out on Blu-ray for some ghastly reason. I don't know anyone with a Blu-ray player that's going to go, oh, my gosh, i got to add the Tooth Fairy 2 to my, to my library. But, it, you know, some I guess Fox thinks that there's an audience for this, so there it is. Go figure. Wait, I'm a fan of the Santana. I know. You dig the Santana. I time. saw him. I saw him at the Red Rocks uh, Labor Day, Labor Day 2011. I went and saw Santana with George Lopez opening. And uh, that's not that. Uh, that's not the show that's on. That's on Blu-ray this week. What's on Blu-ray this week is uh, live at Montreux. Now Montreux, you know, it's uh, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, it's a whole. That's the whole, the whole series, series. From, from Eagle from Eagle uh, Vision. They they do these, and uh, they're always great. They're great, and this one is uh, equally great. This was done in July of 2011. You know what? I, I saw him like uh, two months later, but I I, I wish I would have been there. That would have been cool. Exactly. Uh, anyway, great stuff. Um, all of his hits are here. Make somebody happy, and uh, Black Magic Woman, of course, Gypsy Queen, and I'll tell you, he comes out. He's got a great backing band. You know, with this guy uh, Santana got a great backing band, and then they play, and then out walks Santana with his white suit. He's the king, and he's very much the uh, the, the he's very much the hippie. He talks to the audience all about. You know, saving the earth and being good to each other and blah blah blah. What and a he, man! The what guy a dude. never left. Ni- the guy never left the '60s, and it's wonderful. And he's really he's an amazing guitar player still. So, uh, I would highly recommend if you're a fan uh, of uh, Santana Live at Montreux 2011. Sweet. Check it out. I, I do like Santana. I like his collaborations. I like that he you know will hook up with Michelle Branch or whoever and just kind of do a thing. Michelle Branch. Oh, she's she's she, she's doing stuff still. I mean, she's kind of you know lost a little bit of the luster. Uh, before we get out, I want to make some documentary recommendations here real quickly. Senna is a fantastic, unbelievable documentary. I don't care if you think that you don't have any interest in racing. I don't I don't care what you think. Forget about it. Just see this. Uh, Ayrton Senna, the the famous uh, Formula One racer, is the subject of this incredible documentary. And it's just a great, great freaking movie by Asif Kapadia, who made his uh, directing debut with The Warrior, which was one of those great films that wound up in the Miramax closet a few years back. And he followed that up with a you know a, an erotic thriller that didn't really pan out, and uh, he's back on his game with Senna. Um, uh, Asif Kapadia, a great filmmaker, and Senna is just a really sensational film, one of the best documentaries of last year. Do not miss this. If you love docs, you will go crazy. If you want to infuriate yourself, Enemies of the People, which is a two-disc uh, DVD by uh, Rob Lemkin and Teth Sambat, is all about the killing fields in Cambodia, and it will just tear your heart out, it will tear your gut out, and it will, at the 
same time somehow inspire you despite all of the horrible bleakness. Um, there's some great extras on here, including uh, Q&As with the likes of uh, David Putnam, who, of course, did the Killing Fields and uh, a, a just unbelievably educational uh, documentary. This is a, a must-watch for anybody who cares about the, the subject of Killing Fields. Really a devastating film, but yet humanistic at the same time. And then lastly, Bill Moyers' Amazing Grace. Uh, this is one of those PBS uh, things that Bill Moyers does. This is from Athena, which is the educational line of... Uh, of Acorn and uh, Bill Moyer is always provocative and interesting and this is all about the the hymn Amazing Grace which was written by a famous abolitionist uh, John Newton back in uh, 1779 and uh, really an extraordinary story that was uh, dramatized in the movie called Amazing Grace but uh, I think the story that, uh, that Bill Moyers puts together here is much much more engaging and fascinating and intriguing and all the different performances and the different versions of it are just really deeply moving uh, absolutely a wonderful slice of history that you just won't get anywhere else or any other way because Bill Moyers is is one of those rare, unique American talents. So, Mark, uh, for people who who are out there using Match.com, using JDate, who are <laughs> I feel sad for you. Part, <laughs> I'm your competition. Part of your community. What what's going on out there this week? What should they look for? Are they, are here's, they... Here's, actually, you know what? Here's a piece of advice. Yes. When you're when you're looking for women online. Yes. And you know, women they they have all sorts of photographs. Sure. You know, they have two, three, four, five yeah. photographs. The worst photograph is what they really look like. 